Uh, you know, um, I've, I've been out here off and on for the past uh, couple months. I got some family and some staff and some horses and a teepee that's down there at that camp. And uh, we've been down here because we really believe that uh, water is really important to protect. And we don't like the decisions that have been made. Uh, we think that there are some bad decisions for future generations and that, um, that the water needs to be protected. And so um, we're going to ride horse uh, tomorrow. And I, I thought what I'd do first is just show you a little bit of a video from our organization, Honor the Earth, that I'm the executive director of, that explains a little bit about uh, how we come to be here and, and uh, why we're out here and uh, what we're doing. And then I'm just going to make a few remarks um, about what's going on now and um, then turn it over to some other people. But uh, it's a seven minute video. It's a, and it's much better than me acting it out. <laughs> Not the video, uh, believe me. So um, I just want to thank you all, though, because a lot of people put a lot of work into this, and I really appreciate people here coming out. And um, you know, the other thing I just want to say is that you know, for many years I didn't go to Bismarck. The first time I was in Bismarck was around 1983, I think. I don't have to think about it, but there was a Leonard Peltier evidentiary hearing here. I don't know if any of you remember that. And so I was sent out to Bismarck early to say there's 300 Indians coming in for the evidentiary hearing. And, um, you know, so I remember this town from then, and I remember that it was important that, you know, things are happening just south of you, and there's a lot of good people here. And what I really want to do is make sure that the people of Bismarck and the people of North Dakota understand why we're here. And that we, st we make sure that we all uh, have good communication, and because uh, it's all about the water we all drink. You know, and it's all about all of our collective future. And it may seem like I'm from far away, but, uh, you know, uh, it affects me. What's going to happen here affects us all. So, um, anyway, I'm going to just, uh, we're going to show this little video, and then I'll talk a little bit more, and uh, then I'm going to introduce my friend Candy. Someone to carry our slides. In the break of verses. There's a beauty in the breath of horses. Fall morning's breath seen in the air, the smell and sound of horses. That's the horse I was talking We rode our horses from the headwaters of the Mississippi River here on our reservation. Along with the poorest ride of the new oil pipeline, which we cross our reservation. It was a third of a series of rides on pipelines. We're not protesters or protectors. That's who we are. Are ready? And this we call the Triple Crown of Pipeline Rides. Those rides took us on the Alberta Clipper proposed expansion route to the proposed Keystone XL route in the Dakotas, where riders from the White Earth Reservation joined with the Lakota to ride between Mom Lee and Dakini on the Cheyenne River Reservation. So it was that 15 riders braved some harrowing terrain, a land littered with 100,000 dead cattle from a freak September blizzard, and rode the proposed Keystone route. proposed to cut near our largest wild rice lake. That pipeline will carry fracked oil from the Dakotas. Much of this comes from the homelands of the Arikara, Mandan, and Hidatsa people, also known as the Fort Berthold Reservation, which is under assault by oil companies, and where water
I think Ms. LeDuc is now going to have to act it out. <laughs> Interruptions, reuse them. <laughs> There's a view. Best buy three percent for dessert too. And where water and people are challenged not only by a pipeline, but also by a proposed refinery. The other two pipelines carry tar sands at well. We're in the far north in the Athabascan River, a place that is beautiful and a place that deserves to live and not become a national sacrifice area. Athabascan River region is a pristine ecosystem. That is until the oil companies come that way. Thus far, 3% of that oil, considered because of its extraction method to be the dirtiest oil in the world, has been ripped from the ground. The boreal forests are being turned into sand dunes. Alberta has become the third largest oil producing state, AKA nation in the world. That oil is being extracted without infrastructure to move it. Hence the push for a pipeline, any pipeline. What's at stake is a lot of water and a lot of risk. In Minnesota, it's wild rice, water, and oil. The Enbridge Pipeline is proposing to both expand the present Alberta Clipper, doubling its capacity, and making it the largest tar sands pipeline in the United States. In the Dakotas, it is a land without a single pipeline across it and one large aquifer, the Oglala. The Enbridge Company also wants to construct a 610-mile pipeline from near Tioga, North Dakota, to Superior, Wisconsin. That would carry fracked oil. This is also the same oil as the 800,000 gallons which devastated a Tioga farm in North Dakota early in October. Farmer Stephen Jensen walked into his field and could smell the oil. He had seeds for so long. The 800,000 gallons devastated his field. That pipeline was six inches. The proposed sandpiper line is 30. Enbridge's pipelines are largely monitored by the company. Those go through indigenous territories which are healthy lands, lands that our ancestors wish to protect. We intend to do the same. The single largest pipeline oil spill in U.S. history was a Kalamazoo spill. The fact is that greed makes people act poorly. Rather than investing into efficiency, infrastructure, and renewable or safe energy, the push is to extract as quickly as possible by any means necessary and to move that oil by any means necessary. Right now, most of the oil moving in this country from the Bakken fields moves on railway. That's up to about 380,000 rail cars projected to move this year. This past summer, four square blocks of the town of Lac Mégante, Quebec, blew up as the train's braking systems failed. That train was carrying Bakken oil. Over 40 people were, quote, vaporized in an explosion which baffled Canadian authorities. They had never seen anything like it. That oil, combined with whatever chemicals are in it, is the stuff they want to put into the sandpiper line. The fact is, is that all of these expansions are predicated not on need, but on greed. We think that need is subjective. In Enbridge's application to the Minnesota Public Utilities Commission, access to a, quote, stable supply of oil was the primary measure of need. It turns out that the world's largest oil reserves are in the Western Hemisphere, in Venezuela, followed by Saudi Arabia, and then the Alberta tar sands. Venezuela is a country that has demanded a fair price for oil and used that oil to develop its infrastructure. Instead of paying a fair price for oil, however, Oil interests are far more interested in securing oil from places that do not wish to give up their oil.
people remain committed to protecting our land and water. This is what we are instructed to do by our ancestors, and that is our covenant with our ancestors and our Mother Earth. That is also our covenant with the generations yet to come. This is not just a native issue, an indigenous issue. It affects us all. Whether you have feet, wings, fins, or roots, we are all in this together. No corporation has a right to this land, water, and our future. This is Winona Leduc for Honor the Earth. solar and wind turbines, which seems like where we should be going. Um, the um, Enbridge Company, as you heard, announced that pipeline. We spent four years fighting that. Uh, we went to almost everybody in the country. Um, we, our tribes, health, environmental, uh, um, the process um, in, in Minnesota is better than the process in North Dakota, but yet we are still excluded. In the process, and it was uh, it was wrong what happened to us. But what happened is is that after four years of uh, battling the Enbridge Company and every regulatory process and requiring the company to do a full environmental impact statement on the proposed pipeline, which would cross our best wild rice territories, um, the company withdrew its application to continue with the sandpaper in August of this year. So, Things. One, it is, it is possible to stop a bad project. It is possible to stop a bad project. And it was not a lot of high price lawyers. It was a lot of people like me and you who went to every hearing and said, you can't do this. Um, but the, um, what happened, though, is, is that they bought a third of the Dakota Access. And so I was at this meeting with Enbridge about a month ago, a month and a half ago. I mean, they, they sent out these people first. They were called the Indian Whispers. That's what we call them. They these tribal relations specialists to try to get the tribes to come along with them. And so we had a couple of them. We burned through two of them. We called them the Indian Whispers. But then uh, uh, that didn't work out for them. And then they had this person we call referred to as the Indian Listener that they sent to listen to us. And the Indian Listener, I was meeting with the Indian Listener here about a month ago, and I said, you know, I feel like Enbridge, you have been cheating on me. <laughs> for four years, you told me this was the only possible route that no other route would work for your company. You required us to attend many hearings. You know, you came and, and said many things, and then it turns out you just dropped us and went to North Dakota, so I feel like you cheated on me. <laughs> and so uh, 
we came out here because we don't feel that the pipeline is okay here. If it wasn't okay for us, it is not okay for the people out here. So, this is a few things because a lot of you know more about a lot of the terrain out here than I do. Um, but what I know is, is that a corporation should not be allowed to destroy sacred sites. And when the tribe finally um, outlined where the sacred sites were located, and the next day on a Saturday, the corporation went in there and plowed those sacred sites. That became a, that was a huge problem. The problem of the fact that there is the regulatory process in North Dakota is largely, there's a term that is used nationally and internationally called regulatory capture. <laughs> that means that corporations write your public policy. And that's what has happened in North Dakota. Corporations should not write public policy. Public policy should be written by, for the benefit of communities and not the corporations. Mm -hmm. But in that process, what has happened is that the environmental, uh, the slippage of environmental standards and the fact that there is no environmental impact statement on this project is significant. Mm -hmm. In the state of Minnesota, they're required to do an EIS on a full 310 mile pipeline. Um, that will give you some sense of scope and the reality of the impact of the pipeline. Our position is, of course, they should do what's known as a well to wheels impact statement. In other words, what is the impact where the oil came from? And what is the impact where the oil is going? Issues like climate change, you know, should be considered. Issues of water contamination, issues of if the Missouri River uh, would, should have a right to live should be considered. Because exactly how much contamination can you put in the river? And then say that it will still be okay. You know, so we believe that there should be a full environmental impact statement. I believe that the corporation and the city of Bismarck um, represent uh, environmental injustice and racism. The fact that it was it was not okay to put the <clears throat> to put the pipeline um, above the intake valves for the city of Bismarck, but it was okay to impact the Standing Rock region, um, illustrates a, a continued disregard for the native people of North Dakota. You know, the native people in the room, and I think most of you in the room know that the state of North Dakota has a very long history of disregard for the rights and status of native people. And I believe, frankly, that North Dakota has been left alone too long. Yeah. That is to say that, you know, I mean, y'all live out here, but in my experience, most of the country just kind of flies over North Dakota and says, oh, there's North Dakota. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, that's Fargo, where that funny town is, you know, that funny movie came from. But in the process of having no one uh, challenge the racism, institutional racism that exists in North Dakota, that puts Native people behind bars at such a high rate, that denies Native people basic dignity and infrastructure in a first world country, um, where you know even the road on Standing Rock, 1806, a lot of people get killed on that road. They should have some shoulders. You know, they should you understand what I'm saying is like basic infrastructure issues. Um, you know, that is not addressed, and that racism in, in, in this state has continued. And uh, it's not right in 2016 to treat Native people like that. It is not right as human beings. We need to live, work together. And finally, within that same construct, is the issue of tribal consultation. Um, in this day and age, it is essential, uh, both under international law, under federal law, that tribal consultation will be required. You know, a lot of these projects go through, or the intent is to skirt tribal consultation, is to skirt talking to the people who you will impact the most. And that is not an acceptable practice in this day and age. We need to be accountable for our decisions, and legally we must be accountable for the practice. So that is you know, four of the essential points that we brought us to concern on this pipeline. But what I want to say kind of generally is you know, what I said in the film, is that in our prophecies as Anishinaabe people, this is known as the time of the seventh fire. And we are told as people that we all have a choice between two paths as Anishinaabe people. They say one path is well worn, but it is scorched. It is scorched, and the other path is not well worn, and it is green. And it's our choice upon which path to embark. And what I will suggest to you is that the scorched path is well evident in North Dakota. You know, you have no, now more lawsuits about oil than active drilling rigs. You have succeeded in seeing the contamination of many of your aquifers and much of the water. You have uh, large, besides groundwater contamination, your radiation levels are rising. And along with that, the fossil fuel emissions continue to impact all of us. What happens in North Dakota is not in a bubble. You know, it affects all of us. And you know, what I'm gonna say is, is that this is our time to do something. 
um, you know, I'm, I was pretty happy when, when, when the sandpiper decision came down. We were still facing the second fracked oil, uh, second pipeline, a, a tar sands pipeline in exactly the same route. And so I, I go home to continue my battle against that pipeline as well, because it would have the same impact on our community. And so we are going into round, well, it's about round 18 with Enbridge, but we will call it round two on the pipeline battle. Then we are, we are going to force them to go back and do a full EIS on this on this process. You know, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking at that, but at the same time what I'm saying is, is that the systemic issues are broad. And there is no blaming. You know, what has happened in North Dakota has happened for a set of reasons, but it is our opportunity to, to do the right thing. You know, and, and in my perspective as I look out there, you know, whether it is a $3.9 billion of energy independence pipeline, <laughs> that they're talking about are basically the $21 billion of new pipelines that they are talking about in our territory. You know, what I would really like to see is infrastructure that is for people, not for oil companies. Uh, this country, the United States, has a D in infrastructure. It's the first world country with a D in infrastructure. A lot of the villages on my own reservation, the water is murky. It should not be so. A lot of the, you know, a lot of places have uh, exploding gas mains and roads that are collapsing and bridges that collapse. We are a country that should not be in that state and we are a country which is now facing 50 year old oil pipelines which are disintegrating under the ground. In northern Minnesota we have six oil pipelines that cross along Highway 2 built in the 1960s. One of them has 1,400 structural anomalies. I thought it was 900 but it's 1,400. You know, a structural anomaly is not what you want. You know your groundwater. And what I will tell you is that the pipelines in North Dakota will likely have the same number of such structural anomalies. You know, so to me, if we are talking about things like jobs and labor, we should talk about the number of jobs that could be needed that, that would be more accurately deployed in fixing infrastructure and making infrastructure safe for people. Jobs can be in that industry because it is very important to clean up your old mess before you make a new mess. And there's a lot of work in that. You know, and that should be done. Places like Standing Rock, I believe, should not only not have a pipeline shut down their throats, but they should have solar and wind. They should have people that, you know, people should not die of, um, because they cannot pay their heating bills in the winter, which, as you all know, happened a couple years ago with Debbie Dogskin. There are a lot of people who have a hardship in the winter time because we are northerners and we don't have adequate houses and we don't have, a, have adequate ways to secure our, our, our warmth in our houses. You know, and so I, I told you early on that I'm an economist. That's how I was trained. As an economist, I look out there and I say, why would you, why would you shackle your economy to the bakeries of a fossil fuel industry? It's a very dangerous thing to do. We need a diversified economy in North Dakota. You know, we all do. And for each of us, we need to have something that is security. In my, the country itself spends about a quarter of its money on energy. My tribe spends a fifth. I mean, it spends a, a fifth, it's, a country spends a fifth, my tribe spends a quarter. And I think that most tribes spend similarly high amounts. But if you're spending a fifth or a quarter of your money on energy, what you really want is at some point to have energy that you control. <laughs> at some point you want to have some shot at not pouring it out and then dealing with the consequences, whether it is of climate change or contamination. So from our perspective, we believe that um, Standing Rock should have solar, and Standing Rock should have wind. And we think that North Dakota should have the same. And if, you know, you think that that is like, a, you know, it is not a crazy thing. Because what I know is that which you likely know, um, you know, this country is super wasteful. We're all super wasteful. You know, I lived my whole life in the fossil fuel era. Um, you know, it wasn't my choice, it's when I was born. And we've all been there. You know, I've had a pretty good time, you all had a pretty good time? For me it's been pretty fun, you know, honestly, I've had a great time. But you know, what I want is kind of a graceful transition out of it. I don't want to crash my way out and have no water to drink. I don't want to crash my way out and have the climate so radically changed that I cannot grow food, you know? I don't want to, I don't want to worry every day about my grandchildren. I, I was in California a couple of weeks ago and I was in the Central Valley where most of the food is grown and they have legalized the use of fracking wastewater 
on food. What? Because they have a drought in California. So I'm like, wow. That's what I don't want to hear. I want local food, and I don't want, you know, I don't want that. They apparently use walnut shells to clean it. I was like, that's not working out. So I'm saying, you know, it's, it's particularly grapes and pomegranates is what I understand has affected so far. Tomatoes are the third. That's like a whole fun thing to hear though. I was like, no, you're kidding me. I was like, no, I'm going to show you the one. So anyway, what I'm, I don't want that. I don't think really any of us want that. I think what we want is something that is simple and elegant. And so I see that potential. This country wastes 57% of its energy between point of origin and point of consumption. Our fossil fuels are used as byproducts in all of our agricultural fields. And frankly, without going too far into it, if you put side, things that end with side on your food system, you got to worry over the long haul. Yeah. Same root as the words genocide, homicide, and suicide. You know, probably better try to live it better, you know, with more life. The uh, car that I drove in here, I drove a Dodge Ram pickup. Y'all have the same thing pretty much out here. That car is 16% efficient. Six gallons of gas, one gallon actually moves the vehicle between the <coughs> efficiency of my engine, my drivetrain, every piece of steel and <coughs> junk in there, right? So why does that bother me? Because an electric engine is 65% efficient. And so I'm sitting here, and we're all here, you know? This is the, the world that we are in, but this is the world that it is gonna be really up to us to change. You know, and um, you know, what I can see in coming here to North Dakota, like I feel like that the people of North Dakota that we all deserve better. Mama. You know, the press on the people at the camp and the camp has been bad. And it's wrong, frankly, you know, I, I write for the Fargo Forum frequently and I said it's wrong that there are better stories, more complex stories and in-depth stories written by national newspapers mm -hmm. than the papers of North Dakota. It is time to quit, you know, publishing in the in, in, in energy company press releases. <laughs> yes. You know, and it's also time for us to meet each other. I don't know how many of you have been down at the camp. Probably a lot of you. How many of you have been down at the camp? Thank you for coming down. You know, um, I wanted to bring some of the camp up to you, and I want to keep this uh, going because you know anybody who is looking at this knows pretty much that the world is looking here. And so what we want is peace. And what we want is peace with the earth, not just peace between the people. And this is really an opportunity for us all to make a transition. You know, as, uh, you know, these are my grandchildren. I've raised six kids and I got a whole bunch of grandkids. And I feel like they didn't sign up to have a MRAP on the road in front of them. So I have to, you know, thank the Department of Justice They've helped us also with some discussions with the local law enforcement because I asked them to clear a corridor for us. We're going to start riding tomorrow. We're going to ride for five days along the proposed route. We're doing the same thing that they we did in that, you know, because that's how I was instructed. You know, I was instructed to ride against the current of the whale, and so I did it for four years in a row. We did it together, our community, and in that process, there's about 15 riders. <laughs> uh, you know, one day after our fourth ride, they announced the cancellation of Piper. So I'm gonna stick to that. So I'm gonna ride that proposed route and try to keep the oil out of it. That's why I'm here, you know? And I'm gonna do everything I can in North Dakota to, to try to support a change so that North Dakota is a place that is right with the earth and right with Native people. And I know it's possible, you know? Uh, a few years ago, I was riding with the Cowboys and Indian Alliance. And if you look at it, I don't know if you know this, but remember that Keystone pipeline? Yeah. You remember how they all got that one? Mm -hmm. And then they canceled the Sandpiper, yeah. right? And then Enbridge, there was a big pipeline up in Canada called the Gateway, Northern Gateway, $7.9 billion pipeline that the uh, Federal Appeals Court in Canada pulled all of their permits because they had not consulted with the Indians. So what I'm saying is, is that these are very, very expensive projects that should not be built. And that if there is a shot at resisting this, you know, we should continue that. Because we have a shot at stopping it, you know, and stopping the oil.
because at some point we all got to drink the water. But about four years ago or three years ago, I was asked to ride in Washington, D.C. with them. Cowboys and Indians, I was fighting the Keystone, my sister and I rode. And I don't know, how many of you ride horse? Any of you guys ride horse? So, you know, the one place you don't want to ride horse is Washington, D.C. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do it fine. You know, some day I look all these like cool dressed people and I'm like riding in the middle in the front row. My sister sticks me in the front row all the time. I'm like, oh. So they were riding along and, uh, and uh, there's like people with banners and there's, you know, flashing lights and sirens and like a lot of bad stuff, right? It's scary to ride with, right? It's like terrifying, right? And I get off my, uh, I ride my horse over to my teepee. My teepee's on the Washington Mall, same teepee that's down there at the camp now. Teepees of Washington Mall, and I go down there and I get in my teepee and I hang out at my teepee. This sounds cool, right? Hanging out at my teepee in Washington Mall, and, and uh, Neil Young had been hanging out at my teepee in the Washington Mall. <laughs> Daryl Hannah was hanging out at my teepee, and probably a bunch of people I didn't know. But, and my two sons there, um, their uncles were there, and uh, they were 14 at the time. And uh, so I'm hanging out with my sons in that teepee, and this guy comes and sticks his head in the teepee, and he says, Miss LaDuke, would you like to go for a ride in my car? And I just kind of laughed. I was like, man, that's such a great pickup line from the 80s, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what I'm saying? That's like such like an 80s line, right? You know, like no one says that no more. And I says, I'm looking at the guy, and my kids are looking at me going, no, mom. You know, that's what your boys do. And I said, uh, I was looking at the guy, and he said, it's a Tesla. I said, yes, I'd like to go for a ride in your car. <laughs> so I, I walked out of my cheap into a red four door Tesla. <laughs> and I cruised around, we actually went over to see my little running mate, Ralph Nader. <laughs> which is great, that's like one of those excellent moments and epic moments in history. But basically, that's what I want. I want to walk out of my TP into a Tesla. You can do this, you know. You guys got enough wind power to plow the whole country. And, uh, you know, and uh, we can do this, but we need to work together to try to protect our water. This is our shot. But it's not just a shot from my perspective to protect our water. I think it's a, it's a shot to protect our dignity of how we treat people. You know, because anybody who is here knows that they should not have that much militarization on account of that. My friend and colleague, Candy, uh, where are you up back there, Candy, at some place? Yes, she's coming up for Candy. And she's going to talk, uh, she's from out here, and uh, she's going to talk about what's going on and, and such. And um, thank you again so much for coming out. I really appreciate it. And then later on, if somebody want to visit, we could use some water along the ride a few places. I'll tell you where I'll be if anybody wants to come hang out with us. But thank you again for having me.